the fan fiction to film pipeline. The lines between fact and fiction have become increasingly blurred, a phenomenon that's been significantly exacerbated by the internet. With the rise of social media, the monetization of online content creation, and the help of the almighty algorithm, it's now easier than ever before for individuals to break into industries that were once exclusive. Things that may have once been considered too niche are now entering the mainstream. Fan fiction, a concept that has existed for hundreds of years, has seen a surge in popularity over the course of the 21st century, and at this point, you'd be hard-pressed to find a combination of characters, scenarios, and settings that didn't have at least one fanfic written about it. Certain fan bases have dominated the medium at different times. In the 1960s, it was all about Star Trek, in the 2000s, it was Harry Potter, and in the 2010s, it was One Direction. Some of these stories received millions of views, and as if smelling the money, publishing houses and production companies soon came a knockin'. As these stories transitioned from blog posts to the big screen, concerns about the practice began to arise. Is it fair to use someone else's work as the basis of yours? Is it ethical to profit off of the objectification of an actual person without their consent? Today we're going to be discussing the fanfiction to film pipeline, how the craze began, the popularity of certain fandoms, the impact of One Direction on the genre, and the future of the medium. Let's get into it. Centuries before the idea of copyright infringement existed, it wasn't uncommon to see people publish their own work based on someone else's ideas, characters, or storylines, with these loving imitations being known as pastiche. Because they weren't being threatened with legal action, Unauthorized sequels grew in popularity in the 19th century, being written by fans of the source material who wished to see a continuation of a beloved story. Examples of this included 1913's Old Friends and New Fancies, which took characters from Jane Austen's most popular novels and paired them up with one another. Another example was 1938's Heidi Grows Up, a continuation of the orphan story that was created over three decades after the original author had died. Regardless of how faithful these were to the source material, these stories typically weren't considered canonical, making them the earliest instances of fan fiction. In the 1960s and 70s, fandom culture exploded, especially in the science fiction space. This was best exemplified by the popularity of Star Trek The Original Series in 1965, whose fervent fans were referred to as Trekkies. In September 1967, a group of Trekkies self-published the first issue of Spocknalia, a fan-written magazine, or fanzine, which included artwork, commentary, fun facts, poetry, interviews, and original stories all centered around the Star Trek series. Several other Star Trek fanzines were created over the course of the decade, and due to their popularity, the trend soon found its way into other fandoms like Doctor Who and Star Wars. In Japan, there was a similar phenomenon, with fans of certain manga self-publishing their own illustrated doujinshi and distributing or trading them at conventions. Although these fanzines occasionally included articles and reviews, the bulk of their content was made up of fictional stories that expanded on the source material, many of which were written by women. In these works, it became common to see two of the male characters from the source material enter a physical relationship and these couplings were referred to as slash pairings. Because these stories had to be printed out and physically distributed, there was a limit on how many people could actually read them. But thanks to the internet, that all changed. And soon, self-publishing was only a click away. One of the first sites completely dedicated to fanfiction was fanfiction.net, which launched in 1998. Unlike the fanzines of the past, which focused on publishing stories that featured pre-existing characters from specific works, fanfiction.net was more flexible, inspiring people to completely deviate from the canon. This resulted in the rise of the crossover fic, a type of alternate universe where characters from different IPs could interact. While fanfiction.net dominated in the first half of the 2000s, other sites like Wattpad, LiveJournal, and Archive of Our Own gave them a run for their money as the years passed. Social media platforms like Gaia Online and Tumblr were similarly used as fanfiction outlets, with users role-playing scenarios inspired by their favorite books, movies, and video games. By the 2010s, fan culture as a whole was reaching its peak, 
with geeky media franchises bringing in hundreds of millions of dollars, while popular fan theories, fan casts, and pairings were being discussed by mainstream media outlets. Some of the biggest fandoms at this time included Harry Potter, Twilight, Sherlock, Doctor Who, My Little Pony, Marvel, The Hunger Games, X-Men, and Supernatural. And copious amounts of fanfiction and fan art centered around these franchises made the rounds online. Around this time, a different form of fanfiction known as real person fiction, or RPF, rose in popularity, and featured famous celebrities instead of fictional characters. There had been a few examples of this phenomenon in the past, especially during the heyday of fanzines in the 1970s, with popular band members often being paired together, although they were typically given pseudonyms so the writers wouldn't be accused of libel. History repeated itself in the 2010s, with British boy band One Direction becoming the face of this new wave of RPF. Consisting of five members, Zayn Malik, Liam Payne, Louis Tomlinson, Niall Horan, and Harry Styles, the group was formed in 2010 on the singing competition show X Factor. While they had initially auditioned as solo performers, following their individual eliminations, they were paired together to create one group. And although they failed to win the show, over the course of the season, the boys grew increasingly popular, especially amongst women. This was by no means unheard of. Just look at Beatlemania. And One Direction saw similar levels of fanaticism when they first launched. Apart from their critical and commercial success, at their peak, One Direction had one of the largest fandoms on the internet who were dubbed Directioners, and they often found themselves at war with the Beliebers, Justin Bieber's rabid fanbase. Anytime a boy band becomes popular, a heated debate over which member is the best erupts within the fandom. We'd seen it with the Backstreet Boys, the Jonas Brothers, and now with One Direction. During their early X Factor days, Louis Tomlinson was easily the most popular, having more than twice the amount of Google searches, but things quickly shifted, with Harry Styles dominating for the remainder of the group's time together. Styles was the youngest member of One Direction, only being 17 when the bands released their debut album in 2011, but his age didn't seem to be stopping tweens, teens, and grown adults from obsessing over him. As we've already mentioned, Fan fiction was all the rage at the time, and because of his immense popularity, Styles quickly became one of the most popular RPF characters. While all fan fiction was rooted in age-old tropes, Harry Styles' fanfic tended to be even more formulaic, to the extent that it's now a meme format. The most common storylines included fake dating, opposing gangs, accidental roommates, or even being sold by a parent, with the female character often being a self-insert of the author, allowing them to live out the fantasy where they got to date their favorite celebrity. As is often the case with fanfic, liberties were taken with Styles' actual personality to align with the author's perception of him, and usually all that remained was his brown hair and British accent. Sometimes he wouldn't even be in a band. While self-insert RPF was popular in the One Direction fandom, there were also thousands of stories that paired the band members together, with the most popular pairing being Harry Styles and Louis Tomlinson, a ship that was referred to as Larry Stylinson. This ship was so popular that it spun into a sub-fandom called Larry's, who developed an assortment of cockamamie conspiracy theories in an attempt to rationalize their belief that Styles and Tomlinson were in an actual relationship that they'd been forced to hide from the world. Of the two, Tomlinson has been the most vocal about his distaste for the pairing, saying that there was no truth to the rumors and that it had negatively affected his and Styles' friendship. But the Larrys, ever delusional, refused to accept this, and the fandom became notorious for their harassment of both Tomlinson and Styles, as well as their friends, families, and partners. Larry's received a good deal of criticism, but defenders of the movement have said that it gave people a safe place to explore their queer identities. But I call BS, because if that was actually the case, then they'd understand how messed up it is to dictate someone else's sexuality even after they've told you dozens of times to stop. Sure, they're celebrities, but that doesn't mean they don't deserve respect. Another trope in One Direction fanfiction that was popular were dark versions of the band members, where they were covered in tattoos, smoked cigarettes, and were kind of violent. The romanticization of abusive behavior in fiction is a topic for another day. One of the most infamous examples of dark Harry Styles fanfic is After, which was released on Wattpad in 2013 by Anna Todd under the pseudonym Imaginator 1D. The story followed Tessa Young, a good girl who becomes involved with a bad boy. 
one who just so happened to be British and had friends named Liam, Niall, Louis, and Zane. After was a sensation in the One Direction fandom, receiving millions of views in mere months. Now keep in mind that fanfic had been going strong for decades at this point, but it wasn't actually that common in the 21st century to see them go to print, in part because publishers were concerned about litigation, but also because they weren't sure if there was an actual audience for it out in the real world. Their fears were finally assuaged in 2011 when Fifty Shades of Grey hit shelves. Originally developed in 2009 as Twilight fanfiction, Masters of the Universe, as it was then called, was written by E.L. James under the screen name Snow Queen's Ice Dragon. Masters of the Universe featured Bella Swan and Edward Cullen as the main characters, with the rest of the characters from Twilight appearing as well, but James chose to remove the supernatural elements, making all of the characters human. What really differentiated it from the original series was that James added a good deal of sex and other debaucherous behavior, a direction that she credited to her midlife crisis, referring to the series as her fantasy. The popularity of the Fifty Shades series led to a rise in female erotica in the 2010s, and considering After had already proven itself online, taking it to print was a no-brainer. But before it was published in 2014, Todd made a handful of changes to the story to make its One Direction inspirations less apparent, a practice colloquially referred to as filing off the serial numbers. The most obvious difference was the name of the main male character, which changed from Harry Styles to Hardin Scott. Hollywood loves a book-to-movie adaptation, as it practically guarantees that a chunk of the pre-existing fanbase are going to buy a ticket. And with the Fifty Shades series seeing such a surprising amount of readership in spite of its fanfic roots, there was a bidding war over the film rights. Released in 2015, the first film was a box office success, and its two sequels fared similarly. By the time the trilogy ended in 2018, it had made over a billion dollars, and not wanting to miss out on easy money, Hollywood set their sights on turning another fanfic into a film. One year later, in 2019, After was released to theaters, and while it was by no means the smash hit that Fifty Shades had been, it still turned a profit, and four sequels were later released. At this point, One Direction mania had died down, thanks in large part to the band's indefinite hiatus in 2016. However, the public's obsession with Harry Styles was still going strong. This was evidenced by two separate novels inspired by Styles being published in 2017, Grace and the Fever and The Idea of You. Grace and the Fever was more of a classic YA coming-of-age story, following a superfan of a boy band who meets and befriends the group's lead singer, only to discover that being famous isn't all sunshine and roses. The Idea of You, which was far more explicit, followed a 39-year-old divorcee who falls in love with the 20-year-old frontman of her daughter's favorite British boy band. Although these novels were published traditionally, instead of being posted online first, I don't think that means that they can't be classified as fan fiction, especially considering their inspirations. Zan Romanoff, who wrote Grace and the Fever, has directly cited One Direction and its fandom as the blueprint for the novel, which even included its own Larry Stylence encoded conspiracy theory. Meanwhile, Robin Lee, who wrote The Idea of You, cited Harry Styles as the inspiration for her book, specifically his dating life. Lee, who was in her 40s when she began developing the novel, said she had stumbled across Styles in old One Direction videos and found him to be, quote, so aesthetically perfect that she spent the remainder of the day googling him. During this research session, Lee discovered that Styles had a habit of dating older women, which planted the idea of the story in her mind. These older women that Lee is referencing included British TV presenter Caroline Flack, who dated Styles in 2011 when she was 32 and he was 17, as well as Taylor Swift, who was 23 when he was 18. In more recent years, long after the novel had been published, Styles was linked to Olivia Wilde, who was 10 years his senior. Although Lee claims to have added a dash of Prince Harry and Eddie Redmayne, for all intents and purposes, he's Harry Styles. The idea of you is loaded with steamy sex scenes, which Lee stated was purposeful, as she wanted to challenge stereotypes about older women, specifically those revolving around sexuality and desirability. I respect the sentiment, but I don't know if objectifying an actual person who is barely out of their teens was the way to go about it. By having her lead character, who I'd argue is Lee's self-insert, enter a relationship with a young man who can't seem to get his hands off of her, it allowed her and other older women to live out their fantasies, 
Yes, that's exactly what E.L. James said about writing Fifty Shades, which Lee just so happened to star in. And I do wonder if her time working on that project wound up inspiring the direction of The Idea of You. When it was first published in 2017, The Idea of You became one of the options considered by Hollywood to fill the void left by Fifty Shades of Grey, but the project wound up stalling for several years. Finally, in 2021, it was announced that Oscar winner Anne Hathaway had been cast as the female lead, and the following year, Nicholas Galatzine was confirmed to be playing Harry Styles, I mean, Hayes Campbell. In some ways, it felt as though Galatzine's career had been leading up to that point, like it was his destiny. In 2022, he starred in Purple Hearts, one of many cliché stories published on Wattpad that have been turned into movies, like After and The Kissing Booth. Although it's technically an original story, with its enemies to lovers meets fake dating storyline, it reads like YA paint by numbers. In 2023, Galatzine starred in Red, White, and Royal Blue, which is actually rumored to be a fanfic itself, with people proposing that it emerged from either the social network or Merlin fandoms. With that resume, doesn't he seem like the perfect choice for a movie that is basically celebrity fanfic? The film deviates from the source material just a smidge, with a couple meeting at Coachella instead of a random concert in Vegas, and they're also slightly closer in age, now being 40 and 24. The movie plays out like dozens of other Harry Styles fanfics, just with a slightly older protagonist. She's cool, pretty, fashionable, and independent. Although she isn't reading a book in the middle of a concert, it's clear that she's not like the other girls. She doesn't care about how famous this random pop star is, which he, of course, can't get enough of. At one point or another, we've all fantasized about our idols falling madly in love with us, but as you get older, reality starts to sink in a bit. At least for some. Some fans latch onto the fantasy, claiming ownership of their favorite celebrities because they love them the most and react in anger whenever they inevitably do enter relationships. The idea of you incorporates these parasocial interactions into its storyline, highlighting how his fans don't actually want Hayes to be happy, not if that happiness is coming from someone who isn't them. Look up any of Harry Styles' girlfriends on Twitter and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Although Robin Lee has admitted to Harry Styles serving as a jumping off point for the character of Hayes Campbell, Anne Hathaway and Nicholas Galatzine have been weirdly adamant about any similarities between the two being entirely coincidental, something I personally find hard to believe. Besides sporting similar tattoos, the two also dress and pose in similar ways. Not to mention that in the film, Hayes' fictional band, August Moon, has a song called Dance Before We Walk, which just so happens to be penned by the same team who wrote One Direction's 2011 hit, What Makes You Beautiful. Considering Harry Styles has been dipping his toes into the film industry these last few years, I wonder if the production's hesitance to admit that Hayes is based on him is so they don't have to deal with any awkward conversations at the next industry function. Because imagine explaining to a coworker that you just got paid to do an imitation of them. Fan fiction isn't nearly as popular as it was back in the 2000s and early 2010s, but who knows? Maybe the idea of you will bring it back, or do you think it's going to remain a product of its time? I hope you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye!